At the upcoming Biomass Fuel Summit, we're going to be covering the USDA Regional Roadmap to Biofuels. As set out in the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, Congress mandated that at least 36 billion gallons of bio-based transportation fuels be used by 2022. To coordinate the biofuels scale-out, the Obama administration created a biofuels interagency working group consisting of the USDA, the Department of Energy, and the EPA, co-chaired by Secretary Vilsack, Energy Secretary Chu, and EPA Administrator Jackson. The USDA report is designed to act as a roadmap to align stakeholders in reaching environmental goals, job creation, and energy security. The report provides information on the current production and consumption capacities as well as the projections to meet the fuel standard. Here's how the report described the roadmap. The intention is to develop strategic partnerships with the private sector. By so doing, we expect to expedite the development of research, demonstration products, facilitate the siting of biorefinings through loan guarantees and other programs. You can download your copy of the report at biomassfuelsummit.com forward slash USDA. The USDA's roadmap does take us to the mandate, and the good news is that they're using a fairly narrow range of woody and cellulosic sources to get us there. The EPA has deemed tallow and municipal solid waste as a qualified feedstock, as well as others that they aren't counting. Reading of the report, I learned that we were already had 14 billion gallons of capacity, with another 2 billion gallons under construction. We've pretty much maxed out the 15 billion gallons we can get from food grade sources. And so the next 20 billion gallons that we need are going to be from waste biomass and other advanced sources. The report shows where they intend on getting a lot of the biofuels from. Switchgrass is a leader. Soybean oil plays well. Crop residues. Woody biomass and algae are only at 0.1 billion gallons because they, I guess they don't feel the technology is there yet. Hope they change their mind on that. Looking at the overall estimates, they're look, really counting on dedicated energy crops, grasses, energy cane, biomass, sorghum, to provide quite a few billion of those gallons. Crop residues again came in strong. What I couldn't believe from this report was seeing where they intend to get the advanced biofuels from. 49% from the southeast because of their growing season, 43% from the central east because of the corn crops, which I can understand that they have a lot of installed capacity. But they're counting very little on the northeast, the northwest, or the west. This is a regional sort of program, and they are looking for feedback. I know I'm going to be giving my feedback and sort of my vision for the northwest. So looking at these volumes, let's get a little bit into the economics that they're putting out there. They're assuming an average biorefinery size of 40 million gallons per year with an installed cost of about $8 per gallon. So they're looking at 527 new biorefineries at a cost of $168 billion total to meet these fuel standards. The USDA needs your ideas and commitments with private industry to bring this roadmap to reality. And so at the summit, we're going to be working with USDA national leaders, regional leaders, and local USDA chapters to bring this vision to reality. So come share your ideas, share your commitments, and let's build a biofuels future together. The USDA's work matters to me because I am a biofuel producer and I live in rural America. 20 acres of trees, brush, bald eagles, and biofuel. How's this for rural street cred? Doesn't get any more rural than this. <laughs> My interest in biomass just came from a necessity to get rid of the mounding piles of waste this property generates. It's incredible. And I know if I don't do anything, it's just going to decay and go in the atmosphere. If I burn it, I'll just get fined. So I was looking for a solid way to make energy. And so far, the work that we've done has really gone way beyond my expectations of where we would go. And I'm going to share with you the vision of where I see this thing going, because it's, it's going to make meaningful change in rural America. For those of you who haven't followed me over the last couple of years, we've actually built the world's largest social network for gasification to forward the field. And we have members from 135 countries. We serve over a million content-rich pages a year. We have how-to videos, courses. There's tons of people who are members anywhere from the DIYer all the way up to the industry executive. It's a really eclectic range of people, which makes it really cool. And uh, you know, my personal work, I've, I've built hundreds of different va gasifier variations, refining, 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 finding the, the best technologies and the best solutions. 
and, and put them together. Systems like this one I'm testing in the video are revolutionizing small-scale energy generation because we're turning biomass into petroleum replacement fuels. And here's some of our members at a recent barbecue. We have uh, university professors, engineers, all sorts of cool people. And uh, we just brought some pieces of a gas fire and had them put it together and fire it up. They had a great time. Now I want to take a minute and share my vision for the Northwest region. After looking at the map, I know the Northwest, I know we can do so much better. We have lots of agricultural waste. We have so much woody biomass. And companies like mine are taking and, and turning that into usable fuels. And it's just, there's really not the technology hurdle that I think the USDA thinks is there. We're very close to being able to do this on a massive scale. What my company, Innovatus Energy, is working on is containerized mobile biomass refineries. Something like this container here would produce a million gallons a year. And while that sounds like a lot for such a small space, it's actually only 120 gallons an hour. In fact, the ideal scale up, we would have three of these. They'd come in on trucks and we'd be producing enough, about 9,000 gallons every day, every 24 hour cycle to fill up a tanker truck. So three of these, bring them in, park them where the biomass is, save all those transport costs, produce it on site, send it straight from the refinery to the pump, take the residual heat and use it to upgrade biomass for other uh, residuals and sellable. This can be located at a farm. This can be up in the, with the forest service. This can be at a sewage sludge uh, facility for the wastewater management. There are a lot of different places where these can go. Instead of the old school thinking of let's build these monstrous plants that have to go through years of you know, study, they have to face environmentalists and, and NIMBYs, not in my backyard folks, build these smaller systems, keep them portable, keep them mobile, bring it in. If the biomass does get used up, find another waste source. If you find a more valuable waste source, shift the assets there. What biomass really needs is a clear path to the pump. Biomass has such, such a wide range of types and locations. It's one thing that's made it hard for the industry to get any penetration. Compared to you know fossil fuels, they just park themselves over a big puddle and they start pumping, or they set up a solar field in one place. We have a much more dynamic market. And so using these small scalable systems, we can put them right where the biomass is and develop a series of best practices to decide what outputs we're gonna put and also what are the closest markets they can be used by. So let's look at the forest residue market. What do we have working for us? We have a lot of woody biomass. We don't have any electrical lines to get the electricity produced out and we don't have any means to use the heat on site. So we can get the biofuels, it's stored energy. Probably the best market after the biofuels is upgrading chips, doing 200 degree centigrade drying, driving off that moisture. So the boilers can actually meet the EPA standards. We can solve a couple of problems at once here by putting out a nice high quality dried chip that the industry can afford. It would cost more per ton per se, but it would cost the same per BTU, which is the final price. All right, looking at farm waste, especially types like corn stover, we definitely want to make those biofuels. Again, we can do this a lot of different ways. My emphasis would be on gasification, but there's a lot of other technologies. But taking that waste heat, and we could potentially pump some of it back to the grid as electricity, depending on the infrastructure. But ideally, we turn it into biochar. Some of that biochar goes back to the farm, so we're supporting healthy farms. We're sequestering carbon. And we're getting that biochar to market. Municipal yard waste is usually located somewhere near some good infrastructure. So we get the fuels to market, electricity to market, and taking the rest of it and producing torrified home heating fuels. Power packed pellets that can be used for not only wood stoves, but also for gasification systems that may combine heat and power. And sewage sludge is another opportunity that's not really being tapped right now to its full effect. We can refine the dried fluff, send some of the heat back to the drying cycle, send some of it to making bio coal so we can have clean coal outputs, and then again, sending it to the fuel to the market to local pumps. The days when we could approach the same old problems with the same old solutions is long past. What we need to do in today's age, especially where biomass is concerned and waste streams, is have dynamic solutions that address the market problem where it exists, expend the least energy to get the most value in the market. And I think these containerized systems are a way to do it at $5 a gallon installed capacity. It could save many, many billions of dollars. So we'll be covering this in much greater depth at the Biomass Fuels Summit. We'll have the USDA there, representatives from a number of industries and policymakers.
make sure you're there too.